This morning, we had a chance to really dive into the scope of the problem about how climate change is impacting young children's healthy development. And it's clear it's a public health issue and it's an environmental justice issue. And we also got to the solutions pretty quickly, um, which as we learned from our framing panel, which was also just amazing, where we really need to focus. Um, so for the next few hours, we're gonna dive more deeply into the solutions. Um, we're gonna start um, with looking at some of the initiatives, levers, and investments happening at the national level, and then we're gonna transition to a similar conversation um, at the local level. And I'm thrilled that Dr. Joan Lombardi will be here to share some reflections about what she's heard. We're then gonna have an opportunity to hear from a leading children's health expert Dr. Frederica Pereira from Columbia University, who has authored an amazing book, Children's Health and the Peril of Climate Change. You'll all be getting a copy later on this afternoon. Um, we're gonna hear why she wrote it, her reflections about the day, and what gives her hope going forward. Then we're gonna hear from the philanthropic sector um, and how they're thinking about this issue. Uh, they're gonna use a recent report uh, published by the Aspen Institute and Morgan Stanley to frame that conversation. And you're also gonna learn more about the Clinton Global Initiative, um, which as we've mentioned already, coming soon, September, 2023. Um, and the whole background on making commitments to action. And we'll wrap up the day with a conversation with Secretary Clinton, which is gonna bring many of the themes that we've heard throughout the day together and place this conversation, both the challenges and the opportunities in a broader global context. So let's get started. We have yet another rock star panel. I am thrilled to introduce them. Uh, moderating the conversation is Ralph Smith, Managing Director of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading and former Senior Vice President of the Annie Casey Foundation. Mario Cardona, Senior Advisor, Early Childhood Development and Education from the White House, Domestic Policy Council. Diana Rauner, President Start Early and Co-Chair of the Early Years Climate Action Task Force and Laura Shifter, blocking a little here, senior fellow, uh, this is Planet Ed at the Aspen Institute. Let's hear it for our new panel. Good afternoon. I am delighted to be here. Now, when I say that, uh, many of you may think, well, it's the appropriate thing to say. Look, I'm a nervous flyer. So I am delighted to be any place where the plane lands safely. <laughs> Moreover, I'm even more delighted when I don't have to fly. And I didn't have to fly here. So let me tell you, I am delighted to be here. Uh, and I had an opportunity just to listen this morning. And this was an amazing panel. Let me just say that. We're here this afternoon on the assumption and with the hope that momentum is building and there's momentum at, at the national level and we're gonna talk about that. But when we talk about that, I'm hoping that we're thinking that momentum is more than building, that our responsibility is to make sure that that momentum can be scaled and that momentum can be sustained over time because momentum could be a blip. And as we think about that, I was really taken, you know, I, I like listening to Nat. He can do more with less time than anybody I know. But when we combine the last two panels, here's my takeaway, and Mario, the, the, Mario you, really, you really missed it, and I'm gonna do a really bad job of uh, condensing it. But what I heard is that momentum can be maintained, sustained, and scaled if we find frames that are catalytic and catalytic frames require storytelling. That there's this, an intent to tell stories that, and I love 
not gently telling us that it's not just a story. We've got to be able to weave that story into a meta-narrative. A meta-narrative, and Gary, Gary piled on and said a meta-narrative that's really has a surround sound quality, a surround sound quality that is sufficiently powerful to lever change. I think that was my takeaway from that last panel, and it's something that I'm going to think about on the, on, the way, on, on the way home and think about in the days and weeks to come. And that's why I want to start here with this panel. And Diana, uh, we were on the phone um, a couple weeks ago, maybe, maybe it was just a week ago, and I listened to you say something that I think really goes to this conversation today because momentum really is, can you anchor this effort in the personal stories and then in the larger story? And Diana, you were talking about resilience and assets. And, and as I listened to you, you gave me hope that we're not talking about something that's brand new. We're talking about something that can connect to the real life experience of, of, of people. And I want you, as best you can, if you remember that story as well as I do, I want you to tell that. Let's start us off by telling that story. I'll try. So I think what we were talking about, and this really builds on so much of the great conversation this morning, is the idea that uh, of, of reframing the conversation from one of vulnerability, where obviously we know children are tremendously vulnerable physically and emotionally, and parents and families are vulnerable, to one of assets. And the reality is that the early childhood sector is a tremendous asset. When we think about where children are in the first five years of life, we know they're not generally in the K-12 system, which is a pretty structured system, they're in a very fragmented and frankly under-resourced system. But it's a system that has tremendous trust between children and families. It's a system that really meets families where they are and provides what they need. And we were talking, when I was talking about this reframing of let's talk about the early childhood system as an asset in building really the kind of um, not just resilience, but actually strength, um, social strength and social capital that we need in order to survive as a species. Um, uh, Ralph said, well, can you think of any examples? And I was like, well, yeah, the last three years. So if you think about what happened during COVID, um, really, of course, it was, it was a tremendously challenging time, but it was the um, Head Start programs, it was the home visitors, it was the people on the ground who provided the connections, both the material supports, whether it's food, diapers, formula, or and the, the, relation, the, the trusted uh, conduit of supports and relationships that kept families together. It was hell on the system and on the sector and on the workforce, but people rose to the occasion to do it. And I think it speaks to the asset that is the early childhood sector and the importance of thinking about that as a critical and Adrian said this so much better last or early before lunch, but thinking about that as, a, as the critical foundation for what we have to have in our country in order to survive as a species, survive as a, as a, um, a, a, as a nation, and really to prepare, prepare ourselves for the coming challenges ahead. I think that's, it's important to know we can do this because we can. We can do this because we have. And what we have in front of us is a challenge to do it better and make it more sustainable. We, we've, we've done this. And that, that's what I took away from that story. And I still, that's still my story. I love it. Um, Laura, we want to hear a whole lot about the task force, but not, not right now. Tell us a story that gets us, will get us back to the task force a little later. What's your story? So um, first of all, thank you. Welcome uh, everyone here. It's great to be here. Um, one of the reasons why it's especially great for me to be here is uh, I actually owe Secretary Clinton my meeting my husband. We bonded over the fact that she had just announced she was running for president. And that laid us on the path to getting married. 
Um, and actually then uh, having three children. And that's probably one of the uh, biggest reasons I'm here is a mom. And when my, um, which I also feel like this story would be appropriate for this panel in this setting. Uh, when my oldest daughter was born, you know, as a new mom, I'm blasting way too many photos of her on Instagram. And I've given her the hashtag, hashtag LE2056 because 2056 would be the year that she would run for president. And so each, each of my children have their own presidential hashtag. Um, <laughs> but it was about uh, four and a half years ago when the UN came out with a report on 1.5 degrees warming. I was sitting in my basement with my three children. They were playing down there. And I got news alert after news alert after news alert that we had a decade left to address climate change. Before this moment, I had always cared about climate change. It had been an issue, actually, Matt had bugged me about to care about more for years. And I thought it was some distant problem, something that those people within the environment sector would take care of. And it was in that moment, sitting there watching my children, that everything I felt about motherhood and grief fell on me as I was looking at them. And I was thinking about Ellie's first year as president and what she would be dealing with. And the inequity that would come from climate change, the food scarcity, the water scarcity, immigration crisis, all of this stuff was hitting me in the face as I was looking at my children. And I spent about a week being utterly depressed and then figuring out that I needed to contribute to solutions. And I came to realize that actually bringing what I know in education and education policy to the table can be a real, um, opportunity to advance solutions in a different way um, than necessarily going to the environment sector. And there's an opportunity for us all to think about what we can bring to this broader climate fight. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, let me go, you are essentially either giving credit or blame to Secretary Clinton uh, for, for your marriage. Um, that's, that's, that's a big credit so far. Credit. My, well, my three kids will all be president, so. Yes. When we see her later. Mario, you, uh, had you been here this morning, uh, that would have been very long. Let me tell you some of what came up this morning. Um, investing in the built environment is one of the most important drivers for change. Thank you. That our challenge is not just to build back, but to build back communities smarter. And by smarter, uh, Dr. Mona tells us that smarter means acknowledging that the generational social compact requires us to avoid preventable disasters. And that on our to-do list ought to be investments, investments on the ground to build the capacity of local communities, including local government, to actually do the job. Now, that's, that's a little small agenda for you. I know it's a, it's a to-do list that you say, come on, give me something hard to do. But you know, you're sitting in, uh, in the White House and you see a lot of how this has evolved and a lot of the challenges. So we're going to ask you to talk about that. But before you talk about that, I want you to tell us a story. Sure. Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK. All yeah, right. Good afternoon. I, I'm so sorry that I missed the, the programming this morning, um, but it's good to be with you all right now. Um, so my story and the reason why I'm here is because my, my mother was an early educator. And so when people talk about um, the way the workforce looks and that it is predominantly women, predominantly women of color, predominantly women who are immigrants, that is my mother. Um, and she talked about the importance of early childhood since I was very, very little um, and insisted that my children also have access to high quality early childhood education when, and if we ever had children and, and, and we're lucky, our part, my partner and I do. Um, and so uh, that is a, a big reason why I, I do the work that I do. But in terms of the, the policy work that I do, a lot of it has to do with conversations that 
um, I used to engage in when I was uh, a staff member in the US Congress, um, and where I first got to meet Joan um, when she was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood. Uh, and when people would describe the way that the early childhood system worked at the time, um, and how, how little attention it seemed to be paid at the federal level uh, in terms of the environments that children were in, uh, and how little attention there was to the health and safety of those environments, or whether the quality of services that children received um, was a consideration. Um, and you know there was all this money that was being doled out at the federal level that seemed to have some you know, influence in, in, in pushing some of those things forward. Uh, and so I think the conversation that we're having right now uh, is not dissimilar. It's, it's about where children are um, and about making sure that we're attending to all the needs that they have um, and paying attention to the science around development while also paying attention to all the different implications related to climate um, and knowing that and believing that every child and every person should have um, the right to breathe fresh air and to drink clean water and to live in a community that nurtures their healthy growth and development. Um, and so I'm so happy to be with you all. I'm happy to have this conversation with you all. And I, I look forward to the agenda for the, the to-do list of to -do things list. we should be doing. Well, let's stay with you for a little bit. Okay. Uh, when, you, when you look at the uh, Infrastructure Act, which is a, that's a big deal, where do you see the opportunity for some s solutions that really would keep that generational compact about preventable disasters and actually would allow communities to be built back better, that would allow that building back better to take account of the disparate impact that climate is having on communities and populations. Where, what's, where do you see the sweet spot? Sure, I mean, so, and if it's okay, I would like to expand beyond um, the Inflation Reduction Act because it's really all the different pieces of legislation that the president has signed that have significant resources attached to them. So it's the American Rescue Plan Act, it's the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, it is the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, and it's also the IRA. And so when you think about the implementation of the IRA, there are all these different resources that are included, historic levels of investment to address the climate. Um, and there are opportunities in there to uh, you know, help improve the environment that children are in, many of the implementing agencies are not in the business of early childhood. Um, so the Department of Energy, the EPA, uh, the Department of Transportation. And so um, to the extent that we can receive help from the outside community who thinks about this and would like to provide us recommendations around how we can implement some of those things so that children and families are front and center when they're implementing a lot of the investments relating to um, environmental justice, or reducing emissions, or improving air quality uh, in, in communities that have high concentrations of poverty, um, we could use your help. Because I'll tell you, at the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, and at the Department of Education, they have their hands full implementing the programs that they have, um, and would love to help out in thinking about how to implement Bill and IRA and other things, but uh, it's challenging. It, it, it's challenging. And so like, if there are things that you all see from the outside, um, areas of connection, um, convenience that can be held. Uh, if there are specific recommendations that you have in terms of implementation for some of those things, I think we'd welcome them. Um, and I will mention two things, two, that are invitations to you all. So a month ago, President Biden signed two executive orders in the same week. One was an executive order to um, advance the quality of care in this country. Um, it is the, the broadest um, and represents the most sweeping actions that any president has ever taken to advance care. Um, at the federal level, um, and it includes directives to nearly every cabinet level agency to think about this. A few days after that, the president signed an executive order relating to environmental justice, saying that we need to have a whole of government approach when we consider um, making sure that all communities um, have access to some of the rights that I was talking about before in terms of the environment. Um, and so we're implementing both of those things. Um, they are, they are, are not parallel or mutually exclusive things. Um, and so, Again, would, would appreciate all the ideas and energy and enthusiasm that this community of folks have and your networks in thinking about that. Well, can I, to Diana, can I respond? I mean, it feels to me that that's an invitation you cannot resist. I cannot resist. Go but ahead. I think it's really important um, to, to think about the, the 
both the opportunities and the need. So one of the things that we found with ARPA dollars, gear dollars and everything else, it's very easy to get to, author, to sectors that have clear authorizing agencies, right? But what we know about early childhood is it's a super fragmented system. So getting from um, the IRA and the wonderful opportunities for investment in, 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 in um, environmental justice, even in things like the, the um, child care provisions of the CHIPS Act, all of those things are fantastic. But there's, there has to be support and intermediary structures that get from those federal dollars down to communities where communities can, can actually access them. We'll talk more about the climate task force, but one of the things we've been doing is hearing from, from people across the country. If, if communities themselves don't have the connections between, let's say, their infrastructure people and their early childhood people, it's pretty hard for the early childhood people to access and be part of the climate solution. So it all speaks to the importance of ensuring that as we move from the kind of scientific issue and framing this as a science problem, it's a social problem. When it gets to now the money's there, how we use it and whether we use it well to build the kind of um, strength in our communities is really a social issue. And that's where, okay, early childhood, we know how to do that stuff. Laura. So I think just to add, I think it's just really important to emphasize the moment that we're in and the opportunity that's available um, and how historic it is with the climate investments and the IRA as well as the other bills that are mentioned. But it might not be the way that uh, communities know how to use them. So there's tax credits, there's tax deductions, there's grants, there's potential financing opportunities from green banks. So trying to wrap your head around all of it is a lot for anyone to take in. And then trying to imagine doing your daily job as a child care center and then being expected to know how to do this. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. I think uh, Dr. Benjamin highlighted it in the first panel. We really need to do what we can to make sure people know about these opportunities. Because with the tax credits, with the tax deductions, they're a use it or lose it moment. And uh, and it's not a grant. So if you're doing an eligible project, you get them. So there's really a lot of opportunity that we may need to make sure that people are aware of. Yeah, and, and we partnered on a piece <laughs> that if you all want to know, outlines the opportunity for the early years sector to take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act in particular. And that's just one small segment of all the other opportunities that are out there too. I think you should hold that up again. Uh, that, that, and, <laughs> early years and climate provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and she has extra copies. I do have a couple copies, I do. And she might even have a link. I, oh, we do have a link too, uh, yes. All right. Now, now, this is a good moment. Mari, if you want to respond. I mean, so I will say that um, at the federal level, people are already trying to think about how we can create some of these connections between agencies who may otherwise not seem like they're, they should be, they could be strong partners. So in thinking about like the bill investments, for example, there are historic investments in that piece of legislation to help um, ensure that young children have access to clean drinking water. Uh, and so, a lot of people aren't familiar with that, or with working with the EPA, or know that those investments are available. And so uh, the administrator of the EPA and the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services wrote a letter and tried to reach every single child care state administrator in the country to say, these investments are available. If there is lead in your water, you can use these funds to identify and remediate any of the service lines that you have that are contributing to lead in that environment. And so. There's more to do, certainly. But I just wanted to give that as an example of some of the work that we're already doing. Well, first of all, I'm going to take this moment for the commercial interruption and make a shameless plug for RX Kids. Uh, we heard about it this morning, and I know you've probably heard about it. And I heard about it. Uh, this is really an exciting opportunity to actually bring this national commitment down to the local community with the funding and the capacity to actually make a difference. So we have in front of us today, and we heard about how to make this real. So none of us can go away saying, oh, that was one story or another story. Because when I'm going to ask, Laura, I think you were, it was a school district in Arkansas. Talk, tell us about that story. 
So um, one of the things that we're trying to really do with our national effort is actually uplift the stories that are going on all across the country, because this work is occurring everywhere right now. And it's really important for other people to learn about the work that, that is occurring. Um, with our work with This Is Planet Ed, we really started with a K-12 initiative, and now we've expanded to early years. We have a children's media initiative that's co-chaired by Gary Nell, who spoke, and we've just launched a higher ed initiative. Um, but within the K-12 initiative, I, you know, coming from the panel that we heard earlier about how to, how to bring people into this issue and think about the politics of it, um, I was just at a meeting yesterday um, where we were with a superintendent from Batesville, Arkansas. And this superintendent, Dr. Mike Hester, uh, he inherited his school district when they were facing a major budget deficit. They were dealing with a lot of challenges. They had four established priorities for the school district. Um, student success first, retaining and um, or recruiting and retaining great teachers, uh, partnerships and efficiencies. And one of the things that he realized that they could do in Batesville, Arkansas, was actually work with an energy partner, do an energy audit, and install a large solar panel to help them actually address a lot of their issues. Uh, you might not think of this work happening in communities like Batesville, Arkansas, and it is. And they had 31 community meetings where they met with people. They talked about the things that people care about. Arkansas is the natural state, and they like clean air, clean water, clean mountains. They like the future of their kids. And they loved the fact that what he was saying was we will be able to create revenue that can increase our teacher pay. And that's what they've been able to do. They went from the lowest paying school district in the county for teacher salaries to now they're the highest. The work that they've done at this Batesville School District has spread now to the hospital has a solar, um, a solar array, the community college has a solar array. And so I think sometimes when we're thinking about this and really emphasizing the notion of leading with shared values, the things that are out there, and when we're doing national efforts, making sure that we're highlighting these local stories are really critical to help people understand the potential opportunities that are out there. As I was listening to Laura tell that story and a long time ago, about 35 minutes ago, I heard her tell that story. And Nat's point that he made, he says, we can't see this as a one issue because none of us live one issue lives that we've really got to figure out how to break these. That story, Dad, was a perfect example of the point of the point you made. And I couldn't couldn't wait to have Laura tell that story here because those of us who've had anything, any conversation with Swati Adhakar from the Department of Education in the last six, eight months, we keep hearing about bright spots. Mary, I'm sure you've heard about bright spots. We've all heard about bright spots. And this notion of supporting what we want to do by finding the places where it's already being done feels as a, like a really powerful strategy for change and ought to be part of this national moment, momentum. And that's what, and I think if we all went around and just found the one story we had, the one exemplar, and we begin to add them up, we will see that collectively they really add to this notion that there's momentum for change and solutions supporting that momentum. But the two of you, and um, Mario, the first thing Mario said, when we, he says, I want to hear more about the task force. And so, so do I, and so does everybody else. Could, could you two talk a little bit about the work you've been doing together? Uh, because Mario may know some of it. He certainly knows more than I do, and probably knows more than many of us here. So if you could take a couple of minutes in a colloquy and tell us about the work and what you're finding sure, and about the solutions. So as Laura mentioned, the task force is an, an initiative of um, This is Planet Ed, of Aspen Institute of Capita, and 
many of us, some of, many of whom are in the room, we have a lot of our task force members here today. It is a cross-sector group that has come together both to learn about the challenges that are facing very young children and their families because of climate change, but really importantly, to develop a set of recommendations which we are close to um, working on. We expect to del deliver them in the fall of 2023 around how the early year sector can be a partner and an asset in the uh, in, in what we know is a time of change and disruption for, for us on this planet. And I think it's really important for us to address things in that sense. This is not, um, we did hear, a, we've heard a lot and learned a lot about the health impacts of climate change on um, on early on, 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 on early children, on young children. We've heard a lot about the mental health challenges of parents. But I think what we really are hoping to do with this report is to actually reframe the problem from one of these poor children are so vulnerable we really have to worry about them i think i'm trying to channel Nat a little bit in this or and 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 to this is actually the solution set right here these very young children who by the way are going to grow up to become climate advocates leaders in our country and how with everything that we know about early learning everything we know about development um, do we use this opportunity to build the strongest, most um, socially connected, most capable human beings that we can build so that we will all, as a species, be able to benefit from their leadership and their support? And if we think about the young children as an asset, and similarly, if we think about the early years sector as an asset, again, because it is so focused on relational health, because it is so focused on trusting, building trusting relationships with parents and meeting their both um, practical resource needs, but also their needs for social connection and for support, then really we have the opportunity to make a case, again, even to our friends in the climate world who are still up here talking about you know, methane satellites, which are very important, um, about the people in the equation and how we as a sector have something to contribute to the real need to change again, to, to see how the, how the funds, how the activities, how the change can happen on the ground. Yeah, and I think just to build on what Diana said, um, you know, I have said this a couple of times when I've spoken, the UN Secretary General came out maybe a year ago with another report and it said, we are firmly on track to an unlivable world with the commitments that we have right now. And highlighted, we have a lot of the science, we have a lot of the scientific solutions, but we've lacked the social and political well. And I really think if we, if we thought about actually supporting our children and young people in um, being empowered on these issues 20 years ago, we'd be a much different place in social and political well today. And so we have the opportunity to make that investment in our young people today, not to put it on them, but to empower them. And that's what we do. That's what we do in early childhood, K through 12, higher education, children's media, the opportunity to really um, help empower children and youth to succeed in a changing climate. Um, and that's what we're really focused on. Uh, this is Planet Ed more broadly, that children and youth have the most at stake with climate change and they present the most opportunity and we have a responsibility um, to really help them succeed, develop, have healthy development in the earliest stages, engage in climate change and climate solutions in our K through 12 systems, um, being powered to succeed in the jobs of the future through higher ed and innovate and deploy new solutions. Um, and we all have a role to play in that. Can I just add one thing? One of the other really important, I think, values for all of us in the early childhood system has been, you know, early childhood has enough to do. We're a system in crisis. Uh, we're under-resourced and have been forever. So what this isn't about is early childhood becoming climate advocates. It's really about the climate world being early childhood advocates. And that's a really important reframe because honestly, I think there's still a lot of our talking to ourselves and not yet enough of making the case for why early childhood and the sector and this time in life is such a foundational, important opportunity for addressing the climate challenge. You know, you know that um, reframing or invert, inverting really goes quite well with the admonition that we don't abandon the science. In fact,
fact we embrace the science, but make the argument, some people say about values, attitudes, and belief, uh, not got it down to one word. Made it, make that argument about legacy, and that, that legacy is a powerful cultural force for encouraging folks to do things that they might otherwise not think about doing, not prioritize. So when you say, what do you see climate activists doing differently if they became advocates for children? Well, I think a lot of this is about connecting. So at the local level, ensuring that, that early childhood people, advocates, providers, um, leaders are at the table for uh, for planning, for infrastructure design, for crisis response. At the federal level, it's about ensuring that at every agency, there's an early childhood person who's actually aware enough and and uh, conversant enough to actually be able to, to make the connections and talk about where, what does this mean for early childhood? We, um, I think uh, Mona this morning said the dream would be that there'd be an early, ch a, a, a childhood czar who'd be asking at every project, what does this mean for the next generation? I think that's really, really important. And and again, it it isn't you know it, it's partially about early childhood sort of banging on the door saying let us in, but more importantly, it's about climate advocates and um, and and others in the infrastructure space saying we need you here, we need to hear from you, we need your participation. Yeah, and I think it's a real recognition of partnership, truthfully. I think one of the things that we've seen is the early childhood space has access and trust with communities. And right now, a lot of folks within the climate space are saying, oh gosh, we need, we need demand. We need people to start accelerating these solutions and they might not know where to go for demand. Well, go to the people that are trusted in the community. And those will be your early care providers, those will be your pediatricians, and start talking to them and leveraging them as, um, as communicators and trusted resources, and parents too. Good. Yeah, got that. <laughs> so good. Uh, we have a going back and forth because every now and then in room with uh, passionate uh, early childhood folks, we pretend as if that three-year-old has agency and what that, that three-year-old might trip you on the way to the, to the bath. But uh, the person that most likely to trip is a parent. And so we, we sometimes right, move, move beyond the parent far too quickly. So as we were talking about this, you know, I would, Throw the notion of parents randomly into the conversation. So, Laura's getting back at me by by bringing it up, but it's uh, it's actually true. And especially in the room where you've got Dana and Ron Ferguson, same parents is a really good thing because they got they will beat me to that if you don't. Mar Mario, hello. Uh, I really want to hear. Uh, you've been generous. You've really been generous, not only with your time and with coming today, but you've been generous with inviting recommendations, inviting input and the like. I would really love to get your take on what you see as the two or three solutions that have the most power, but also would be accessible to input and guidance from the people in this room. Are there a couple of things on the list that you would say, hey, pay attention to this? Yeah, um, I think, you know, to Diana's point, having folks who are deeply engaged in climate care de deeply about the impacts that the implementation of all these different federal laws have on children is essential. And part of that too is having a deep level of sophistication around and knowing when the policy opportunities are in implementation. And so that means uh, being laser focused on thinking about regulations that may be coming out, notices of funding opportunity that may be coming out, guidance that may be coming out, um, webinars that like agencies should, be, agencies should be holding, all those different kinds of things sort of set the table for how these things will last well beyond this administration. And agencies are thinking about all of those things now. And so to the extent that you all are thinking about things to do with respect to implementation of bill or IRA, um, you should be talking to agencies now. The second thing is, you know, I think the point that Laura made was really well taken in terms of wanting to make sure that you're engaging the early childhood community because one of the things that the Department of Commerce did when it was rolling out its Chips and Science Notice of Funding Opportunity 
uh, and including the requirement in there relating to um, ensuring access to child care for workers who are going to be you know, in these manufacturing jobs and making sure that you have uh, you know, a, a, an equitable workforce, um, is they talk to, to the early childhood community because they're like, we're the Department of Commerce. We think about industrial policy. However, if we're going to ask these big companies to help implement this, like all of it's not just going to be on-site child care. Like, what else do they need to be thinking about? And then, so of course, the early childhood community is like, the children are in family child care settings. The children and families need access to more supply in their communities, and there is insufficient supply. Um, we need to make sure that as these, as these systems are getting developed by uh, employers, that they are building off of the infrastructure that exists in communities with respect to early childhood, as opposed to displacing it. All of those things were super essential. And that agency was very receptive to all of that feedback, because that's not what they do all the time. And so similar to this in terms of the climate work, I think that if you were to come and say, hey, Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, EPA, these are the things I need you to think about when you're talking about improving the air quality in certain places, or when you're thinking about um, you know, some of the, the building and infrastructure work that's going to take place. Um, I'm sure you'll meet a receptive audience. I'm certain of it. Yeah, I want to underscore the importance of um, investing at the federal level in the kind of intermediaries and support that get to this very fragmented system. Because one of the challenges is, even with um, the great opportunities in the IRA, how are individual family child care providers going to access grants to put shade um, in their built or, or air conditioning or remediate mold. I mean, that's, again, these are programs that don't have that capacity. Most of us can barely, you know, get our dishwasher fixed when it breaks. So, so thinking about um, the supports, again, that are needed at the community level to make sure that the money, you know, money sometimes, federal money and, and, and state money flows um, into the deepest grooves first, right? We all know, and if we want to use, if we want to build a more equitable system, and also one that really reaches um, the, the the people who are working with a, with again the most vulnerable, and also in the most fragmented system, we're going to have to be investing in the actual work that it takes to get that money to the right people. Yeah, you know, that was a point. I think it was Dana Long this morning, who I think emphasized in terms of her uh, guidance paying attention to getting the funding on the ground first and not having too many filters and too many of the organization. Now, all of us know that getting federal dollars down on the ground is really problematical because you've got all sorts of accountability and the like, which is why this notion of build, being intentional about building capacity and building that capacity up front I think is really, really important as we, do, as we don't have that capacity. Dana's advice won't be followed because we are not going to be able to do that. So I don't know what you see as the federal role there and whether there are ways to really push those dollars down and push them down to the, with the capacity that's going to be needed to account for them. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about what you mentioned is like getting funds down to the ground. I mean, it sometimes it people's definition of the ground is different, you know? Because like if you, if you think about people who are eligible or entities that are eligible for funding, for example, and then you constrain that definition so that it doesn't account for the diversity of providers in early childhood, then it's not going to get to the people who need it most. So when people create, um, you know, grant programs, for example, that only go out to local educational agencies, that's wonderful. But if you're trying to get to early childhood um, communities, then you have to look outside of local educational agencies and think about Head Start agencies, and you have to think about family child care, and you think about child care centers that operate as businesses. Um, and so I think that making sure that people have that type of orientation is essential. In terms of uh, other things that we could be doing, um, we can always use our convening power you know, at the federal level to bring together folks who are thinking about this at, and, and connect folks who may not otherwise be connected. Um, that is a, a role that we can play and can be really, really helpful, especially as people are thinking about implementation of all the different pieces of like yourself. I have a good idea. For you. Sure, please. So um, one of our task force members, Melissa Rooker, is here from Kansas City. And I, I think the exemplary work that Kansas City has done to bring the early childhood community into the, um, into the climate conversation has been fantastic. My idea is we've had early learning councils started by the Head Start Act, um, you know, for, number, for a number, number of years across. We should have um, early year years climate action councils 
And um, we have some exemplary exa of examples of that, but every state should should have one. And that would be an awesome way to get us to get us together. Sorry. I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I couldn't help myself. Well, I just wanted to say I also think one thing that's really exciting is looking at like the environmental justice block grants that have gone out um, with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, there has been funding set aside for what's called or being named tic tacs which are actually about building community capacity to access these funds and it's about um, making sure that local community-based organizations have access to grant writers know how to navigate the federal system and try and give um, organizations that might otherwise be left behind or not have the same capacity access to these dollars so i think there is a lot in there right now that is at least targeted towards helping communities and we need to help with the surround sound and making sure more people know about it too. Uh, most of the people in the audience don't know this, but moderators are intimidated by a clock. You can't see it, but I can see it. And it now tells us that we have run over by 20 seconds. Uh, and Patty Miller uh, says that my handicap is 25. So uh, I am just going to thank all. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, what a great session. And thank the panelists. Thank the panelists.